Now we're recording. Now we're recording. Excellent. Well, welcome everybody to our latest edition of Theocon, Theology in a Time of Crisis. We're delighted to have you all with us this evening as we are talking about theologies of action. And we have had some pretty fiery talks um, that we've engaged with from our speakers uh, this evening. Uh, once again, as usual, uh, I'm Sarah Lane Ritchie, coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, and as well, uh, Trip Fuller is obviously here, and he is also in Edinburgh, Scotland. And um, so we're delighted that you have joined us. Thanks for being here. Uh, if you have not had a chance to watch the recorded talks from our guest speakers this evening, stick around. Don't leave us. You um, are going to love the conversation we're about to have, and you'll kind of pick up um, on the general theme of things. And then as soon as we're done, you can go watch the talks or download the podcast version um, and, and, and get yourself caught up. So uh, similar setup as usual, uh, I'm going to start, start off by just introducing our speakers and our guests, and um, then we will just dive into the conversation and the responses. And uh, as usual, do feel free to send in your questions or your comments uh, on whatever uh, platform you are engaging uh, with, this, uh, with this conversation, and we will do our best to work those into our evening together. So with that, let me introduce our, um, our, our guests. First up, we have Grace Jisun Kim, who is professor of theology at Earlham School of Religion in Richmond, Indiana. I'm sorry, almost said it, Virginia, Richmond, Indiana. Uh, she writes and teaches on constructive theology, feminist theology, post-colonial theology, and Asian American theology. Uh, she's the author or editor of 19 books recent titles of which include Hope in Disarray, Piecing Our Lives Together in Faith, Reimagining Spirit, Keeping Hope Alive, Intersectional Theology, an Introductory Guide, co-written with Dr. Susan Shaw, uh, Healing Our Broken Humanity, co-written with Graham Hill, and interestingly, The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to the Holy Spirit, which I think Tripp had something to do with. Um, uh, interest, uh, pertinent for this evening, Englewood Review of Books listed Reimagining Spirit as one of the best theology books of 2019, and Intersectional Theology, co-written with Susan Shaw, as one of the best theology books of 2018. So some good stuff here. Uh, Grace served on the board of directors for the American Academy of Religion, better known as AAR, which many of you will be familiar uh, with, of course, and um, uh, she was involved as an at-large director, which many of you will be aware of. Uh, she's also a member of the working group on climate change for the World Council of Churches uh, and has served on the board for the Korean American clergy women and is also a member of the Peace USA, uh, Presbyterian Church USA Social Ethics Network and is actually ordained an ordain ordained minister in the Peace USA as well. Um, so thank you for being here. We're delighted to have you. Uh, next up, we have Sundar John Bupalan, uh, who I call John. Are you still going by John? I, I am. <laughs> okay, we're still calling you John. I knew John uh, when we were at Princeton Theological Seminary together ages ago. So, uh, so, so he's he's frozen in time for me about ten years ago. Um, John Bupalan completed his PhD in religion and society at Princeton Theological Seminary. He has a book out entitled Memory, Grief, and Agency, A Political Theological Account of Wrongs and Rights, R-I-T-E-S, uh, which was published in 2017, and is the outcome of his postdoc research uh, at the Episcopal Divinity School, Cambridge. Um, Bupalan, Bupalan, I'm referring to you as your last name now. John uh, he draws from anthropological and ethnographic data, particularly pertaining to caste and race, and recently, um, has signed a contract with Fortress Press for a co-authored book, Project Dalit Theology, A Global Introduction. He has a recent essay entitled Saving the World Through Ethnography, which is published in the Journal of World Christianity. And he's also an ordained minister in the progressive Baptist tradition and is part of the collective of Dalit ecumenical Christian scholars. And finally, we have <clears throat> Megan Lumanya Ulishni, who is a postdoc research fellow in theology and science at the University of Nottingham. And she's actually uh, working on a, um, 
a, uh, the, a postdoc, um, this postdoc project uh, called the God of the Book of Nature, which Tripp and I are also working on. And so we are working with, with Megan and, and, and several others quite closely on the Science of Age Theology project. And, and it's, it's truly a, a delight. Uh, Megan completed her DPhil at the University of Oxford, Oxford and she's working with uh, Graham Ward on the Christian Doctrine of Original Sin. Uh, and in particular, the relevance of that doctrine in a post-Darwinian world. She's done a lot with sexual selection. Uh, her current project explores theories of sexual selection and the extended evolutionary synthesis and the relevant points of intersection with theologies of nature. In addition to publishing articles on topics within the field of theology and science, Megan has also published on the topics of contemplative spirituality, feminist theology, Augustine, Teresa of Avila, and the theology of Edward Skilibex. So thank you all for being here. It's delightful to have you. And now we're going to turn things over to Grace first and then John to go ahead and give a brief um, overview or summary of their uh, recorded talks, which hopefully you've already engaged with. Um, and then we will move into some discussion. So Grace, take it away. Well, thank you so much for the invitation, Tripp and Sarah. Uh, my AirPods suddenly are not working, so I don't know if you can hear me okay. Okay with that, because I know it vibrates in the room, so I wanted to ear use the AirPods. Anyway, thank you for the lovely introduction. I'm just like listening, I think that's not me, but anyway, thank you for making me sound better than I, than I am. Um, it's such a joy, and anything that Tripp has asked me to do, I've said yes. So I'm so glad when Tripp said he was doing this, particularly at a time where, you know, the whole world is just experiencing this pandemic. and. Um, some of you are here in the U.S., some of you are elsewhere around the world, but here in the U.S., it's been very difficult. So when Tripp asked me to talk about um, spirit, I thought I'll tie that in with some of the crisis that's happening here in the U.S., um, particularly, um, you know, I'm an Asian American theologian, so what's happening with the Asian American um, population. So as soon as the pandemic arose, the rise of anti-Asian um, racism just went up. And so there have been cases, hundreds of cases of violence against Asian Americans, uh, physical violence and verbal abuse, um, racism directed against um, Asian Americans just in public. Um, some of them are well documented. People now have cell phones and so they can document this and show it and share it. So that has been very um, painful for me to experience during this time of crisis when people are dying, we don't need this added layer of racism against Asian Americans. And of course, uh, Trump is no help in this matter. He just makes it worse and worse. And, you know, he started off with, um, I know, China virus or uh, some other names, and now he's on Kong flu. And so he is actually just perpetuating this racism against Asian Americans. But if you've listened to um, the short recording that I shared, this is not just something new. Um, it has been part of the American narrative. So racism is just embedded in American history right from the beginning of um, you know, white Europeans coming here, um, bringing the uh, Africans as slaves here into the U.S., the genocide against uh, um, Native Americans, and what we did with Mexicans and Latin Americans. So, you know, there is just so much racism that is part of our American history. So I just wanted to just give kind of an overview of the Asian American racism and then move a little bit into the spirit theology, which I am hoping will help us kind of overcome this racism, not just against Asian Americans, but against all people of color and um, different forms of isms that exist um, today. So, um, you know, Asians have been migrating around the world for work and, and brought over in different places and different um, places around the world and came to the US. I don't know, there's records about 400 years ago, but the recent kind of huge migration of workers that were brought in was about 1850. And that's not a coincidence, you know, with um, slavery ending um, in um, 1865, 
Americans, white Americans needed cheap labor. So Chinese workers were brought in to work in the uh, railroad and, and digging and doing mining and very other dangerous work. So that happened and when the Chinese were brought over as workers and indentured workers, a lot of racism against um, Asian Americans. And, you know, with the fear um, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. So white Americans were now terrified of um, yellow people coming and they didn't want any more. So that was to prevent no more Chinese from entering into the US. That was supposed to be in place for 10 years, but that expanded um, to 19, around 44. So that's a long time. So the Chinese that were here had to carry papers. They couldn't buy property. There was a lot of discrimination. One of the largest lynchings were against the Chinese in, in the LA um, Chinatown. About 18 um, Chinese uh, men and young um, youth were hanged at that point. So you see a lot of racism against Asian Americans. Then we had, um, you know, during the war, the Japanese were rounded up and they were put in. Uh, uh, they were put in camps. So, and, and when we look at it, the, the Asian Americans weren't allowed to vote till about 1943. So that's a long time that they were here that weren't given any rights. And so the stereotyping, the racism, and also against women too, is very, very high. And now with this pandemic, so I'm just kind of giving a, a quick overview. With this pandemic that's happening, it just uh, rises up. So the physical uh, abuse against Asian Americans is spiking and the verbal uh, abuse against Asian Americans. So as a theologian, I wonder what can be done in this time of crisis? You know, we have a lot of power for some of us in the church, as church leaders, as professors, or as administrators, or some other vocation that we work in to change the dialogue, to change the course of the isms that's happening in this world. So for me, you know, when I think about the racism, so much of it is embedded in how uh, white supremacy works, white privilege works. And that is also um, kind of uh, reinforced by our white Christianity. So our, our image of God as white, our Jesus image uh, as a white male. So this whiteness. So to move away from this whiteness is, the, the way to move away from the whiteness, the whiteness of God and the whiteness of Jesus and the whiteness of this whole church um, that is spreading around the world is to kind of center ourselves and view God as spirit. So moving away from the white male God that's been portrayed to us in art and in, in, in our interpretation of scripture and our sermons in all of our Western theology for the last 2000 years, the way to, to prevent that because this whiteness in religion and in Christianity perpetuates this white supremacy, the white privilege, and the racism that happens. So my, my hope is to move away from this whiteness is to move towards spirit. So I'll kind of leave it there because I can go on for the whole hour and a half that we have, but I'll, I'll let John talk and, and, and Tripp respond and everybody else respond. So I'll, I'll stop there. Grace, thanks so much for going first and uh, for mentioning this very, very uh, ever-present reality, which is we actually have the power to do something in a time of crisis, right? You have the power, I have the power, everybody on the screen here has power, everybody seeing, everybody seeing, everybody hearing, has a certain amount of power to do something, to effect change, right? So I'm actually really looking forward to the conversation with you, Grace, and Megan, and Tripp, and uh, Sarah, and special thanks to Trip and Sarah for organizing this. Uh, really great effort. And for listeners uh, listening in or viewers viewing, we all have the power to do something, right? So this is what I'm most interested in hearing about and engaging with. How do we actually employ the power that we have, little or more, and effect 
change in a time of crisis, right? So I'm John, I was named John at birth. Uh, I, my parents come from two different uh, castes, actually antagonistic caste communities in India. They come from two different linguistic communities. Uh, so we moved uh, different states in India. And when you move from state to state, you really move from one territory into foreign territory, as it were. That's how India is constituted. We spent a few years in the Middle East, in Abu Dhabi, in the United Arab Emirates. And we moved around a little bit. Now, for the last 10 years or so, I've been in the United States. And that's where I'm speaking from, the Boston area, from the state of Massachusetts, which is actually a Native American tribal name, which I think has a lot of implications for some of the pieces of the conversation that we may or may not have. And I'm so really looking forward to the conversation. If you haven't listened to my talk already, I want to briefly just summarize my talk. And you will see when you listen to my talk that I summarize my talk also in my talk in the first uh, four minutes or so. Really, this is a repetition, but I want to stick to the very basics in this kind of introduction before the conversation. So, uh, and I'm, I'm a very specifics guy, right? So I, I, I want to go down and talk about the specifics, but I'm going to resist that and just offer some general, general statements. The first is, I want to invite us to just kind of go back to the beginning, uh, kind of go back to the beginning, not just of my talk, but go back to the beginning of the beginning as it were. Uh, where God is presented as creating the world, right? Now, some people believe that God created the world out of nothing and that somehow because God created the world out of nothing, that this demonstrates God's great power. And that's the most important thing about God. I believe to the contrary that while the former may or may not be true, more importantly and more fundamentally for Christians, I think God created the world out of love and for love. And you'll see this in my talk too, that political theological thinking is really a thinking about love, a thinking about the world and how to make a world out of love and for love, right? So that's the first thinking that I wanted to present about political theology. That political theology simply says where love is, God is, right? In other words, political theological thinking also asks where is love present? And political theological thinking also asks the question, where is love absent, right? So, uh, so political theologians are always looking for places where love is present, but are also looking for places where love is absent. And then asking the questions, why? <laughs> why is love absent? How is it absent? What are the social dynamics that create the absence of love in particular times and places, right? So that's the first thing that I want to uh, just give as an overview. Uh, the four major parts of my talk that you'll hear and that you'll see me kind of engage with in this conversation and more uh, is uh, one, just social location, right? I'm Indian, I carry an Indian passport, I live in the United States, I'm male, I'm able-bodied, I am Dalit, I am heterosexual. Uh, you know, I, I have so many identities that I have with me. And, and Grace, I, I, I know you, you've written more than I have about these things. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. So talking about social location, that is all our different identities, I believe is just so, so, so important simply because it helps me to understand myself and it helps me to understand others. So in other words, it helps me, helps me to understand where I am coming from and helps me also to understand where others are coming from. And social location is important, not simply in a time of crisis, so not simply for 2020, where everybody's talking about this thing. So social location is not this ad hoc perspective, right? Social location is something that we carry with us throughout our whole lives and across time. So that's the first thing. The second political element that I want to mention is this question of binaries, right? The one binary that I want to briefly mention is this whole binary of oppressor, oppressed. Uh, uh, now in our current political moment, at least in the United States, when people, for instance, say Black Lives Matter, that makes some people uncomfortable because they say, oh, if you're saying Black Lives Matter, does that mean that other lives don't matter. So people are kind of a little uncomfortable with binaries. And that's not simply like a political problem. It's also a theological problem. Many, many theologians, in fact, have a problem with binaries, right? And, and political theological thinking, simply put, does not have a problem with binaries because political theological thinking says, you know, the world as we know it actually does have binaries, right? So what does that have to do with theology? That's the second thing. The third thing is I want to build on this uh, notion from liberation theologians theologians, which is a preferential option for the poor. The preferential option for the poor is simply another way of lifting up 
a scriptural category, a category from the Bible, as we know it, is to lift up this category of the least of these. So how do we live our lives in accompaniment with the least of these of the world, right? So that's the third thing I simply want to present for discussion. And finally, I just uh, stop by saying, political theology is a theology of love, right? So, uh, so political theological thinking does not believe that Christians are in the world and not of the world. <laughs> political theological thinking does not believe that. Political theological thinking simply believes that Christians are in the world and for the world, right? So it is a theology of love. So let me stop there. Awesome. So uh, before Megan gives her a response, I was going to highlight a few connection points that um, if you if you you have know, already listened to the full talks, you're going to get. And 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 these two talks were surprisingly synergistic, and I'm I'm pretty excited about it. Um, uh, the first element that shows up that I would love uh, to dig in into is uh, the way our misplaced confidence in theologies of abstraction uh, support the ongoing injustice in the world. And, and, and I think there's a type of misplaced concreteness in the tradition um, as if the tradition arrived uh, from nowhere, right? And, and what happens when we perform theological abstractions? What do we lose? Sometimes it's the context of the referent, right? Grace mentions that uh, surprisingly God and Jesus are white and they aren't in anywhere in the Bible. Like Whitey's not in it, but surprisingly we can do it, right? It's, and then you see people on your Facebook feed freaking out because someone on Twitter told them that somebody suggested perhaps you shouldn't have Swedish Jesus up at your church. And they're just like losing their biscuits, right? But when, when, you're, when you have this misplaced concreteness in an abstraction, then the context of the referent, our Hebrew Lord, disappears. All of a sudden, Augustine starts to look pasty. Like so much of our tradition does that. You can also abstract by um, abstracting away the very context of tradition, traditioning, in that ongoing flow in the different context of, of the church and its mission in different places and locations. It, it, there is no non contextual theology. But when you abstract context from it, all of a sudden, what do you have? Systematic theology. But what is systematic theology? It's called Eurocentric theology, and it's my favorite. Why? Because I've been reading that junk since I was little. Why? Because I was a preacher's kid, born in Christendom in the South. I asked big questions, and what are the books that are handed to me? Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Paul Tillich, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Yeah, like this is what gets handed to you. And you read it. And it becomes the means by which I have this radical encounter with the life-giving God. And I learn their language because their language helps me reflect on these experiences. And all that stuff goes on. And that's perfectly fine if it doesn't lead me to become radically Eurocentric Orthodox and then make fun of everything that's not a real theology by calling it contextual or practical or lived. Right? Both of the talks insist that one of the biggest problems that reigns in the church, why this time of crisis is revelatory of our own unjust patterns, is that we not only have abstracted the Jewishness from Jesus, we've abstracted the Eurocentric nature of the Western church, and surprisingly, or not so much. That means we've internalized the logic of colonialization and then pretended that it's just necessary for salvation. Um, and underneath that, the, the second point of connection is the way that move problematizes the politics of love. Uh, Grace uh, spends time pointing out, and she didn't emphasize it here, how in multiple different contexts, uh, in different cultures, language and symbols of the life-giving presence of the divine emerge. Right? And one way of looking at that is to go, wow, a large number of cultures across all of our planet 
thought it necessary to have a symbolic referent to get at what is getting itself done when Christians talk about the third person of the Trinity. That's one way, and that's not how we normally did it. And, that was, <laughs> and I think that reason is one of the things that's so important to think about that connection between that moment and the politics of love and John's talk. Why? Because you think in objects. That's what humans do. Everything in the world shows up as an object for you. And some of them are genuine subjects. And if you're a panpsychist, even more of them are. But that's not what we're talking about. But that's even true like in your partner, right? Alicia, we've been together longer now than we haven't, but I've always seen her as an object. She only shows up that way, but we stay in love precisely by attending to the mystery of the subjectivity, right? But she shows up as a body and her body and what she says and does is a symbol of this deep subjectivity. And love recognizes that every construct of the object is just that, a construct. And that means you deconstruct it when you learn more. And that's true, not just with the person you love the most, it's true with your kids, it's true with friends. Like all of us here have had different relationships prior to being here. I mean, some of it's new meeting, some of us have known each other for a while. But when you're, when you're doing the politics of love, if love is there, then yes, they show up as an object, but you never dissolve the mystery of their subjectivity and that means deconstructing and then constructing again how we see our neighbor, our enemy, the earth, and all identities is essential. And so if we can't learn to be intersectional theologians, uh, and we can't learn to uh, not bear false witness to the difference in the communities around us, then we won't learn to be Christian theologians. And, and why is that radical to say? It's basic things, but uh, the way I just wanted to emphasize those because they, they resonated so strong. And, and the last thing they both emphasize together is that crisis, and we think about those the observations I just said, uh, crisis makes reality visible. And for the, those on the underside, when the people of privilege go, wow, I can't believe a police officer sat on his neck that long. That's just really wrong. Uh, then there are plenty that go, this is when you get it, right? And, and then you get like the crisis of COVID-19 and all of a sudden people are noticing how different their skylines are when you aren't burning fossil fuel all the time. And they're like, well, I guess there's something to that. And there's so many ways that crises break through our ideologies and reveal that what we called reality was really an interpreted version with an ideological guide that does not desire the flourishing of all living things. And, um, and the best example that popped into my head is that so often um, when, uh, and one of the questioners mentioned it, but so often conversations that resist or resent contextual theologies get frustrated when they hear the word whiteness. And uh, someone asked how that works. And, I, and, and what it pops in my head is that when whiteness is a skin tone, we ultimately protect the perverse power structure it holds up. And, and maybe the language isn't the best, but whiteness is not precisely about the melatonin levels of your skin. It's about an ideological power structure that is normative for Western civilization. And so in the protecting of whiteness, you're protecting uh, uh, the, the reality that we might finally uh, be acknowledging in the numbers that can really inspire change. So um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'm, I was so excited, looking forward to everything. And uh, with that, Megan uh, has some things to say. Great. Uh, thank you so much to Sarah and Tripp, of course, for organizing this whole the whole series of conversations um, and also for inviting me to be part of this and um, I think the topics that we are covering here are so important and they're um, could be really uh, life-changing for all of us and, and hopefully for people listening um, and then secondly thank you to Grace and John for your um, compelling and, and really really thought-provoking contributions it's been wonderful for me to learn more about the work that you're doing so I'll start by responding to a few things from Grace's talk and then um, address John's talk in the second half 
Grace, it was so helpful to learn more about the history of racism against Asians in the US, especially in light of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. When we have seen anti-Asian racism, um, we, we're, we're realizing again that this is not simply a relic of the past, but it is instead a wound that continues to fester within US culture. There are two things you mentioned as you discussed the history of anti-Asian racism in the US that I wanted to pick up on um, and raise for more discussion because to me they seem really pertinent for our situation today. The first thing I wanted to highlight is that you mentioned that um, so there was this influx of immigrants from China and other Asian countries who came uh, to work in the US in the 1800s. And you mentioned, uh, and, and you said this again actually in your summary, that um, white Americans became afraid. And then actually, uh, I think earlier you used the word terrified um, and started telling them to go back home. And it was this mention of fear. It was sort of, it's a, a small mention in light of your whole talk, um, but it really struck me as essential actually to the talk because it seems so central also to the crises that we face now. Um, I think it's really difficult for people, um, for all of us, uh, ourselves included, to resist becoming gripped by fear and being controlled by it. And this then contributes in major ways to the crisis of racial violence and oppression that we're witnessing now. I think fear has played an interesting role in shaping people's responses to the pandemic. So uh, I'll, I'll say just a couple of things about that. On the one hand, in terms of fear, uh, and maybe you, maybe you all have seen this as well, I've seen this narrative emerging from some people of faith, especially Christians, saying um, we shouldn't be controlled by fear, and therefore we shouldn't wear masks, we shouldn't social distance, et cetera, because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. On the other hand, it seems to me fear has been working in another way during the pandemic, where you have some people in, in the US in particular, I've noticed this, really seeming to be intensely afraid that the government mandates and the restrictions during the pandemic are somehow part of like a larger plot to diminish civil, civil liberties. And so I see fear um, manifesting in lots of different ways uh, during the pandemic and, and then also contributing, as I said, to, to the racial violence um, and as this kind of powerful force driving people's resistances to taking precautions against the pandemic. As a side note, I wonder if fear, and I suspect that, that it is the case, if fear is also important for understanding the phenomenon that John discussed, whereby the wounds of the world, racism being one of them, are concealed and covered up rather than exposed. I wonder if that also has to do with fear. Um, and so there can't be healing, but maybe we can discuss that more later. So I raised this point about the ongoing crisis of fear that fuels racism and, and the certain ways in which people respond to the pandemic because it seems to exist in such a contrast to everything that you say later about the goals of the spirit-centered theology. And um, my sense was that a spirit-centered theology has something really generative to offer in terms of combating this systemic fear. You spoke about how the focus on chi, on the spirit, is a way of emphasizing the embodied presence of God in our lives. And this struck me as so relevant um, in terms of the discussion about fear, since fear is such a, a deeply embodied and affective experience. Um, the question then that arose for me as I was reflecting all, on all of this is this, um, in practical terms, especially since we're talking about theologies of action, how do we envision transformation through the spirit happening, especially related to this crisis of fear? Are there ecclesial, personal, or institutional habits and disciplines that we should strive to develop as a means of participating in the ongoing work of the spirit, especially when there's such a need, I think, in our time? Um, and, and, and then it, it led me to think as well, what, is this, what would this work look like for academics, for those of us working in the academy? Um, so that's the first thing is just I thought was so um, pertinent from your talk was uh, the centrality of, of fear and how it kind of spirals out in lots of different ways in, in the crises that we're facing. The second thing I wanted to highlight, Grace, in your talk um, was your mention of the importance of a sense of belonging and how devastating it was that this was withheld from the early Asian immigrants to the U.S. The need for a feeling of belonging seems to me to be so central to what it means to be a creature and to be a human in this world. And I wonder as well if it's a lack of a sense of belonging or um, also withholding belonging from others, if these things are also contributing in some ways to the contemporary crises that we face. 
failure to extend belonging to others, or perhaps um, it's connected to fear then that if we allow others to be welcomed and to feel at home, there will be less for us, so we have to exclude. Um, perhaps these things are also at the root of the racism that we've seen enacted against Asian Americans and, and Black Americans lately. In light of the importance of this sense of belonging then, I wanted to return again to thinking about the spirit-centered theology that you develop and what it can offer for us here. You made the point that using different words for spirit can help us to create more expansive notions of God and that it can also help us to remember our interconnectedness. And I thought this idea was really compelling. It, it led me then to this question, what does it look like to cultivate belonging, especially as we're very socially distanced in significant ways for the near future? Um, so we're all kind of, we're in our own homes, we're, we're doing a lot over Zoom, um, but it seems to me that this sense of belonging is, is also at the heart of, of what we're trying to talk about and what um, a political theology is also trying to cultivate. Um, and so I wondered if we could kind of be creative and, and think about what does it look to like to cultivate a sense of belonging um, during a time of social di distancing? Uh, yeah, and then, then, and then as well, if there are specific ways um, that academics contribute to belonging or, um, or perpetuate feelings of non-belonging. Um, so th those were kind of the two things I wanted to highlight. There's so much more, of course, that we could discuss and I hope we'll get to in our discussion, our discussion together. Okay, so I'll tr transition now to some reflections on John's contribution then, which was so thought provoking. John, I thought it was really important that you emphasize the necessary political dimension to theology, um, because I think there can sometimes be resistance to, on, on the part of theologians to getting our hands dirty with politics. It's tempting to want to escape, I think, the painful complexities of daily life. And for some people, especially the more um, intellectually inclined, I guess you could say, theology can become a really convenient way of distracting ourselves from the complexities and, and the painful realities of everyday life. So I think what you're doing in, in your talk in terms of emphasizing the necessary interconnectedness of po politics and theology is so crucial. And this as well seems so important for our time. I've seen quite a few people, and maybe you've come across this as well on your um, social media feeds, expressing fatigue or exhaustion um, in response to the overwhelming crises that we're facing today with the pandemic and the racial oppression that has been coming to light. I think for some people, the response to this fatigue is to become, and, and you discuss this in your talk, indifferent, um, or to find various ways of distraction and numbing. So this led me to wonder then, how can we as theologians provide inspiration or motivation for people to choose to continue to engage politically, especially people of faith who might be tempted to see their faith as actually a way of distancing themselves from politics. So what's the role that, that we can play in trying to provide some energy for people um, and some motivation to keep engaging um, when, when it does become really overwhelming? Related to this, I thought what you had said about the importance of developing awareness of our social location was so important, especially where you spoke about how social location conditions our habits, our senses, and our imaginations. I thought this was so fascinating and that it, it prompted so many different thoughts that we could discuss, but it led me to wonder um, about how you see this playing out in the context of the pandemic that we're living through and in the context of this growing awareness of the ongoing need for more work to be done to achieve racial equity, especially related to the, um, the question of imagination. I was really intrigued by that. And so I'm wondering, are failures of the imagination partly at work in the problems that we're experiencing in our culture today? And then what work needs to be done to revitalize and expand our imaginations? So to move now to another topic that I found really thought provoking and I'm really eager to talk with, with you more about this, uh, is the issue of binaries that you discuss. Uh, so uh, as a feminist theologian, I would say it's somewhat ingrained in us, um, and maybe, maybe Grace would agree, uh, to want to dismantle binaries. It's, it's kind of in, it's in sort of the tradition of feminist theology that where we tend to be suspicious of binaries, we like to deconstruct them. And instead to emphasize things like hybridity and dynamism, um, and this, this type of language is, is much more uh, predominant in feminist theology. So I wanted to think more about this with you and um, to understand the importance of binary within your framework. 
on the one hand, I can see, I see what you're saying, the importance of, um, as you say, the binary for helping us to make political assessments and judgments um, and having this binary of oppressor and oppressed. But on the other hand, I wonder, um, is the oppressor not also oppressed in a sense by sin? And maybe it's a matter of emphasis where um, we, we would say yes, but um, you know, primarily still they're the oppressor. Um, so for example, in the context of the US, we can see that there, there is a binary in that white supremacy has perpetuated violence against people of color. On the other hand, white supremacy is absolutely toxic and destructive for the, the white people who perpetuate it as well. Um, so perhaps the oppressor has more power and privilege than the oppressed, but an oppressive system also wounds those who, who are benefiting from the system. Um, so anyways, it's just to say, I found this point um, really thought provoking and I was, I was just eager to bring it up for more discussion with the group because it challenged me. Um, and then the final point that I would raise uh, in response to your talk, John, was your discussion about um, how concealing and covering wounds perpetuates inauthenticity, or as you say, I thought this was a great quote, a false piety that leads to political apathy. And ultimately that this concealing and covering prevents healing. I thought this was such a brilliant insight and also so relevant in terms of um, addressing our current crises. I've been really discouraged to see many other Christians and, and people of faith be really resistant um, to acknowledging the existence of things like systemic racism, of problems with racially motivated police brutality. Like people are very resistant to saying there might be some problems with the police. Um, and uh, in the US context in particular, resistance to identifying racial disparities and the effects of COVID-19. There's so much avoidance, there's so much denial and there's so much concealing of these realities. Um, and I wanted to ask then, what conditions are necessary to facilitate communities being able to expose their wounds? In what type of setting should this or can this take place? And so I'm thinking about communities in the sense of institutions, families, ecclesial bodies, what kind of needs to be there um, in order for there to be a setting where we can have um, a, a genuine conversation and exposing of real wounds that are there? Um, and then, yeah, how can we kind of contribute to developing this? Um, so I'll end there and uh, I look forward to discussing more with both of you. Thank you, Megan. That's wonderful. Um, I'll turn now to First Grace and then John to offer some brief responses to Megan and then we can get into a more free flowing conversation. So thank you. Uh, Grace, you might be muted still. Let's see. Oh, no, you're not muted, but like we, there we go. Uh, now you, there. Okay. There we go. We're good. Sorry there about go. that. Yeah. Um, do I respond to trip two or just to Megan? Uh, I can respond to anything. Well, anyway, thank you so much to trip and Megan. You know, I, trip is doing a zillion of these with you, Sarah. So I don't know how he keeps on top of everything, but I always feel every time trip says something, I'm like, he always says it better than the way I said it. So I just sat there and Tripp gets so excited and he's all into this. So he said, whatever he said, it's like, I wish I had said that. And I have always felt it. I've always felt like that with Tripp. Even when I was writing that homebrew Christianity book on the Holy Spirit, I just thought, Tripp, why don't you just write the whole book for me? Because his points were like so much better. So thank you, Tripp, for um, some of your insights and how you were able to listen to both John and, and my talk. And when I listened to John too, I just agreed with John and I thought, yes, you know, there's so much synergy. There's so much that connect us. And, you know, as a fellow Asian American, I think this was great pairing so and trip was able to kind of highlight some of our talks and where it came together so that was so helpful trip so thanks again uh, for your insights and just how you say everything so much better than me both in writing and um, verbally so I'm so grateful for that um, just to go to Megan I just you know um, Thank you for your insightful comments and the points. Um, uh, the two that I that you highlighted, the fear and then the belonging. 
it's strange that there is fear of other people. So when I was writing the book, Embracing the Other, that came out five years ago, um, I kind of wrote that because I see so much fear, not just against Asian Americans. I highlighted that today because of uh, COVID-19 and of who I am, but there is fear of the other around us, whether it's a racialized fear, our sexuality fear, you know, socioeconomic, there is this, this fear and it's, and it always makes me wonder why is there this fear of the other? You know, and I think what scripture, what, you know, what theology is for me, at least when we're talking about liberation theology or intersectional theology or feminist theology is to overcome some of these isms is really to overcome the fear too, whether it be racialized or even gender, you know, some people are so afraid of women. I don't know. They think we're going to do something. <laughs> Maybe we'll, you know, change the world. I don't know. But there is this fear. And so, and when I think about the Asian Americans, so our, 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 our history here, the yellow peril, where people were so afraid of Asian Americans, you can't have any more Chinese babies. And so you got to stop the woman from coming. So at, even from the beginning, a lot of the Asian women weren't allowed to come in. And those who actually were permitted to come in, you know, the hypersexualization of Asian Americans, of Asian women, you know, they're, they're the, uh, uh, you know, they're there as sex workers, or, you know, we do this in culture, in our movies, in our books, and our plays. So that always, you know, that was from the beginning of the, the mass immigration and the migration of workers. So we, you know, this yellow peril that have kind of stayed with us. So, you know, with this COVID-19, people suddenly get afraid of us, as if all Asians are going to carry, um, uh, the virus, you know, all Asians are, are the ones that brought it here. There's just sudden fear. So I think as theologians, we do have to question this fear. Why is it? And, and try to remove the sense of fear. So, you know, always when I'm tackling these different issues, it always leads to the spirit. So Tripp and I, we've always talked about the spirit. Tripp has interviewed me several times about the spirit. I think you know, uh, and we joke about it too, you know, the first 2000 years of Christianity is, is Christocentric and the next 2000 and I think beyond <laughs> will be spirit centered. It's, it, it always, all roads lead to spirit and I think all roads lead to intersectionality. So that's why I thought what John was talking, it's all this intersectional ways of being and understanding. So uh, I, I was very excited. The, the notion of belonging, you know, when, when you see the, um, the racism against Asian Americans right now, you'll hear comments like, go back home. You know, there was a, a nurse, a male nurse standing on the road, and they were doing this uh, demonstration. And um, a white person came out of the car and said, go back home. You know, nobody yells that out to some other racialized group. But most of the cases when that's yelled out, it's against Asian Americans because there's a sense of not belonging here in the U.S. It doesn't matter if you're first generation, you know, fifth, sixth generation, there's a sense of you don't belong here. So while as a, a European immigrant, say from France, came and they can't even speak English, no one will yell at them, go back home. You know, you're, you're not American, you know, you got to leave because you're still white looking. But the sense of you don't belong here, you never belong here. So always yelling, go back home. This has happened over and over again, our whole immigrant history. And during the elections, you know, that happened again with when Trump was, you know, that whole election cycle, people yelling at Asian Americans, go back home. So the sense of not belonging in this land is it's a horrible sense of feeling. Even though, uh, you know, I grew up in Canada, but I am a dual citizen, American and Canadian, but the sense of you don't belong here is also, it ties in with the fear. And how do you overcome that? Is back to the spirit, the trip um, so well, kind of uh, eloquently talked about. You know, this, this 
spirit that is experienced in all culture and all people and 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 some cultures the spirit you you know ruha you know this breath that i've never as a presbyterian pc i'm more in pcusa but i grew up in canada so i was exempt from the hebrew exam so i never took hebrew but i you know always think if i was younger i would do it but I don't know the Hebrew, but I'm always talking to my co colleague, Nancy Bowen, and this Ruha, you know, it sounds like breath. And when we talk about Yahweh, she wasn't so convinced, but, you know, Yahweh is this breath sound. And I know I'm not saying it right, but it's his breath. And so we as human beings who are all alive are breathing. And that's why, you know, when um, George Floyd, you know, when he was yelling out, I can't breathe. That was so painful for me to watch. And I watched over and over again, as everyone around the world has been watching over and over again. When you sing, I can't breathe. You know, the breath of God is in us. The spirit of God is in us. You are killing the spirit of God by taking away someone's breath. That's why it was just so painful to watch. And so the spirit that resides in all people, in all cultures, in all religions, all the religions, the major religions, all talk about the spirit. They may have a different word. And so, you know, when, when, Christian, when Christians around the world, you know, and we want to have this notion that only we can talk about the spirit, we own the spirit, everyone else is evil. I just think that's such a small view of God. You know, this earth is quite big. I haven't gone around the world, although one day I want to go around the world when this virus, this pandemic dies. But I've never left the planet Earth, as hardly any of us have. But the solar system is so big. This universe is enormous. And to limit God, this infinite God, to this small, minute notion of just this, is so limiting to me. And so I think part of you know feminist theology liberation theology intersectional theology when all these things intersect and we hear different voices from disabled from able and from different sexualities it really convicts us in how we've always articulated and understood god and and it will eventually move us away from the whiteness of this male notion of God, this white maleness of Jesus, and I think we'll move to the spirit. So thank you. Thank you, Grace. Uh, John. Grace, I want to start off from where you left off in some sense. Uh, uh, and then of course, I, I know we are, we are in this particular segment responding more to Megan, which, which I will, but because you mentioned it, uh, and I do want to come back to this in, in the general discussion with you, Grace and others, that privileging the Holy Spirit has a profound value, right? For all time, especially in a time of crisis, but also during other times, it has a very profound value. And this is really now I'm going to use uh, your language here, Grace, that uh, the church does not own the Holy Spirit, right? I mean, this, you say this in your book, Spirit. Uh, and uh, that, that was actually one of my entry points into your uh, reading your work, engaging with your work, that the church actually does not own the Holy Spirit, which means that, the, which means that God's Spirit is at work everywhere, right? At work everywhere, really, and among all persons and communities. And that, uh, that is almost by definition, boundary crossing, right? Almost by definition, boundary crossing. And this kind of foresees your question about uh, binaries, Megan, because you know, in, in that sense, it actually does permeate and break boundaries, right? So if, if boundaries are not being broken, then there's something wrong. There's something wrong, and, and that what is wrong is not the Holy Spirit, but the, but, but human persons who are creating boundaries that does not allow for the working of the Holy Spirit and does not allow for the working of the divine. Right. So I'm actually very very thankful to you for privileging that aspect of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I I just wanted to mention that, and, and I'll say more about those things because I really am very very interested in that thing. This misplaced confidence in uh, theologies of abstraction, like you put it, Trip, I think is such an important realization for all of us to have. Uh, because this, this 
this tendency to just abstract from lived realities is is an ever present danger right among communities that identify as christians among communities that don't identify as christian right and as an indian i'll have to say that in the indian context there is a story right and this is an abstraction right in the, in the, in the indian context this is only one story this is the dominant story by by no means do all indians accept this but one very dominant story in india is that you know that that people categories of people categorized into castes came from the divine uh, head right uh, from the divine body some people came from god's head some people came from god's arm some people came from god's thighs some people came from god's legs and it's it's like a hierarchy like the lower you go down in this hierarchy the lower your caste ranking is the lower your position is in society and you're treated as such and then tribals and dalit communities in india actually do not fall in this fourfold category they fall outside of these categories right so in this dominant imagination in this dominant abstraction dalit communities and tribal communities don't even count so they're not even part of the godhead right so they are really both called and treated as untouchables even to this day so this kind of abstraction has political consequences right and we see in, in christian imagination too there is this thing right so for instance scripture has all these uh rich insights right for instance scripture would say something like people come from uh, 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 people come from the east and the west and the north and, and the south and dine at the table of the lord right it, it's a great insight from scripture and yet in our churches when we look around us we are almost always hanging around with those who look like us dress like us earn like us sound like us feel like us hate the same things we hate love the same things we love and so we are thinking oh my god what happened to that east west north south thing so that means okay there is a certain abstraction and there is a certain abstraction that creates the creates this problem with whiteness right this is the way in which whiteness works in both phenotype and in ways that exceed phenotype uh, conditions right so uh, that's why i feel like talking about social location talking about bodies is very very vital talking about bodies let's let's look around us who are we hanging out with all the time do they sound like us do they look like us and the thing with the year 2020 or in our own current time is we don't need to really like get on a plane and go somewhere else to meet somebody who is different from us right people who are different from us are just down the street are like downtown are are at uh, the local station right at the bus station at the train station everywhere people who are different from us are everywhere i mean look at the screen in front of us right we look at the audience who's engaging with us people who are different from us in more ways than us uh, one are always around us so paying attention to bodies i think is highly highly vital and i'll change gears and very uh, quickly respond to megan's excellent insights megan you have a way of reading uh reading and hearing work that is just fascinating so i do want to honor that and respond to your uh insights one is a question of fatigue very briefly i'll say responses to fatigue i i always remember what uh, miguel de la torre who teaches at ilf school of theology said once uh he said you know when you're fatigued do two things <laughs> i i'm paraphrasing here right i'm paraphrasing here a little bit he said always choose an area of passion right all of us because we are marked by time and history and context we have areas of passion right so because i'm a dalit theologian when it comes to caste discrimination i i'm not messing around right that's an area of passion for me so if if i see caste at work i'll name it i'll analyze it i'll intervene in that situation right so there's an area of passion so when it comes to fatigue choose an area of passion that will ignite ignite us right rather than fatigue us The second thing Miguel, Miguel de la Torre says, which I find really helpful, is choose an area of complicity to undertake acts of responsibility. Right. So that's why I say when I when I in, when I employ my social location stuff, right, and when I say that I am a heterosexual male, then for me an area of complicity is actually patriarchy. Right. So because I have investments in patriarchy, I have to address questions of gender justice. Right. and this is why i really appreciated when grace said you know some people are so afraid of women and then i i know a lot of men who are afraid of women right because they then they then they say hashtag not all men right but i feel like that's such such a terribly misplaced misguided hashtag right the question of patriarchy 
far exceeds particular men, right? So there's no really no point in me as a heterosexual man saying not all men. Oh, I'm a nice guy. I treat my wife well. I'm such a, you know, this, that. That doesn't simply apply, right? So uh, this fear that people have, I think, is really misguided because we have to think about areas of passion, but we'll also have to choose areas of complicity. Now, I think the, 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 the particular call that one might want to embrace today is don't choose 20 areas of complicity, right? Don't. Don't choose one, two, and then work your way through, right? If, I, if I'm saying, okay, oh, oh, man, oh, I'm looking at the news and I'm, I'm complicit in like 120 things, that may be true. In fact, I think complicity is like that. But let's choose two, let's choose one, let's choose three and work our way through areas of complicity, right? So that would be my first response to the question of fatigue. I think the question of social location, I think is a really important one because it does form our habits and senses and imagination. And I think the pandemic has really brought this out, hasn't it? The pandemic has really, really, really brought this out. And I'm really grateful to you, Grace, for kind of mentioning this anti-Asian violence that is actually very, very prominent during this pandemic, right? Almost always, I'd, and I hear, here's where I'd agree with Grace and maybe just nuance that a little bit. That question, where do you come from or go back to where you came from? is a very unique Asian American experience. It's also an experience that many Latinx persons and communities face, right? Uh, this, is, this has really become very prominent during the pandemic, right? So social location, I think, becomes all the more important to consider during a pandemic, but also at the same time recognize that this is what Asian Americans have been always experiencing, right? And this goes back to what Tripp said earlier is, is when you see a cop standing on a person's neck for over eight minutes and literally choking the breath out of the person, murdering the person, some people are going, oh my God, that's so terrible. And other people are throwing their hands up in the air and say, really, do you only now know that? Our breath has always been choked. We are always dying. We are always being murdered. So I think social location kind of is accentuated during times of crisis like the pandemic, but also at the same time allows us the opportunity to think about these things, not simply in ad hoc ways, but, but in ways that kind of accompany us throughout our lives, right? Uh, that shows us different areas in which we are complicit in social violence. Uh, the question about binaries, Megan, I think you identified a really important one. And I'm simply going to repeat what you said here. So bear with me here for a minute. I think what binaries help us to do is to actually make political assessments, right? Uh, that there are actually oppressed, oppressed binaries. And this is why I think uh, Grace's remark about how, uh, how men are so afraid of <laughs> women, I think is really important because the binary is real, right? When it comes to gender, as, as much as we know that constructs of gender are superficial, right? Just like race, just like race. And you know, most recent studies in race, I'm, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, I know, but, st but this is generally for, uh, for everybody listening in and seeing. People today say that I may in fact be having my DNA more closely related to Grace and Sarah rather than my wife, who is Indian, right? This is just the truth of DNA. And yet, and yet people believe in this illusion of race, right? And so I think binaries, being suspicious of binaries is very, very important. So I think binaries need to be transcended that way. But I also feel at the same time that binaries actually allow for political assessments. So as a man, then I'd say, yeah, binaries are real. Whether I, even if I believe that they are superficial, which they are, they have power. They have ways in which they operate in society that actually divide men and women. To come back to the gender sexuality question, right? Uh, a woman called a church once. I, 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 I'll make this very, very quick. I'm, I'm serving as a pastor now. A woman called a church once and said, are you a rainbow church? And I said, you know, I, I played dumb for a little bit. And I said, well, what do you mean? Help me understand uh, what you're asking. Uh, and we are, we are a rainbow church, right? We are an open and affirming congregation. Right? But I said, help me understand uh, uh, what you're asking. They said, do you believe homosexuality is a sin? And I said, well, let, let, let's, let's take a few steps back. Let's take a few steps back. And I asked her a question. I said, uh, I, I asked her, have you met redheads? And, and, and just so, you know, I, she doesn't I misunderstand the question. I said, uh, you know, people with natural red hair. Have you met people with natural red hair? 
And she said, uh, yes. And I said, do you know in the United States that the number of red heads, right, more or less matches up with the number of intersex persons? These are persons who might not be, now uh, Megan, this is why I appreciate your question about binaries, because intersex persons transcend binaries from birth, right? They are persons who may not be read, readily identifiable as male or female, right? Even biologically, forget the cultural constructs of it, right? So I said, have you met red, redheads? The number of intersex persons in the United States is the same number of redheads in the United States. And she said, what does that have to do with the question? I said, well, in scripture, scripture says God made humans as male and female. If we in fact do believe that God created everything as good, as Genesis chapter one would say, in fact, it says very good, then intersex persons are good. They transcend boundaries, which means that actually God created the world more than simply male or female, right? And yet we believe, believe based on scripture, so we say an abstract a certain reality and say, no, the, the world has to work only as male and female, right? Only as heterosexual. Where did we get those ideas from? I, I think for Christians, the call today when we think about binaries and the need to transcend binaries is to hold our deeply held beliefs in creative tension also with life. So this is, you know, what Elsa Tamez, for instance, would say, how to bring together, right? interpretation of life and all its complexities, along with the interpretation of our deeply held beliefs in one single movement, not as two movements, but in, single, in a single movement, right? And I think the last one about false piety, and this is where I'll stop in case you're wondering when I'm gonna stop talking is this. <laughs> this is the last one I'll say for now. I think uh, false piety is, is such a real thing. And I'm not superimposing this thing and saying, only other people have this problem. I sometimes wake up with this problem, right? So I think false piety is a problem that affects everybody, Christian or not, but particularly because we're talking about Christian churches, I'll just venture out and say, yes, it is actually a problem that affects uh, Christian churches. Uh, how many discussions have you and I have been part of where we talk about racism or gender justice or uh, uh, any number of things, economic justice, climate justice, and somebody will say, Somebody is bound to say, and I say this in my talk, and, 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 and so I won't bore you with that example. I can I give a different example. Somebody is bound to say, why don't we talk about positive examples? Why don't we say something positive, right? And this is why I think we have resources within the Christian tradition that actually encourage us to think about the range of emotions, not simply things that are positive, but also things that are deeply, deeply disturbing that don't make, make us feel good. And how to actually treat those instances and situations that have integrity in, its, in, it, in themselves, not simply as a means to something that's more positive. And, and, and I'll just quickly mention the name of uh, Oksana Yakushko. Uh, who's written an excellent book called uh, Scientific Polyanism, in which she analyzes this concept really, really well. Uh, and I think uh, anything that does not reveal wounds, anything that conceals wounds is part of the problem. And all of us are complicit in that in, in, that in different degrees and different kinds. Uh, so let me stop there. Awesome. All right. So we're going to be conversational for the next bit. And while you were talking, um, my Twitter blew up. So I've been scrolling through these and then told Sarah, I had to ask the first question because I got, you know, when you get a question where they give you no context, cause they just assume everyone understands the context. This is the tweet. <laughs> Retweet, and, and this was a reference to something you said. Retweet, racism is a lie that kills, right? Like in that, um, the, your DNA reference. Uh, what do Megan, John, and Grace think are other lies that we live by with deadly consequences? So if you're thinking of lies we live by that have deadly consequences, are there particular things that come up? Wow, that's uh, wow, that's pretty big. I think the big lie is that God is white. We live by that. We've preached it. We've taught it. We've written about it, and I think that has grave consequences that 
God is white and male and maybe older. I don't know. Maybe that has an intergenerational <laughs> problem too. But that's a huge lie that we've lived it. And we continue to spread that lie in the pulpit on Sunday morning. So I think, you know, these lies, and you know, that's just one big lie that I grew up with too. And it's had grave consequences. And I think if we're going to live in a peaceful world where we can belong and where we can love, um, someone was talking about love earlier, we got to get rid of this white male God. And so I've seen signs recently that um, James Cone was right. You know, and when I, when when that George Floyd happened, I just thought when we in scripture for those who are biblical scholars, you know, all throughout and John talked about it to the, the um, you know, God's with the oppressed or um, God is with those who are marginalized or with the underside. God is, you know, Jesus is with the Samaritan woman. Jesus uh, welcomes the sinner, the sinful woman who anoints his feet. You know, Jesus and God turns everything upside down. And so if God is with the oppressed and God is with those who are cast aside, those who do not belong, you know, the most cast aside, the pushback is, are the black people. Then therefore God must be black. And I just, it was such a powerful moment viewing that, um, video of George Floyd, you know, God must be black. So we, that's the biggest lie. And I know, you know, Tripp mentioned it earlier and everybody gets all uptight and everybody's so scared about a non-white God. Why are we? Because we've always put white people at the top. White is best. White has always, it's not just in Christianity, but it's in our culture. It's in our society. It's in our kids book. It's everywhere. It's so embedded. Racism is so embedded in us. Patriarchy is so embedded in our, in our whole psyche. It just gets passed on generation after generation. So these are the biggest lies. And if we want to turn the world upside down and make it right, especially during this time of COVID-19, I think that's one lie we got to get rid of. Yeah, so I, whoever tweeted that, I have to check out your Twitter account later, Trip, and see what's happening there. Yeah, I would just chime in because I think that's also, it's a great question, um, what are lies that we live by? And, and the one I think that has come to my mind because I've seen it come up um, from a disturbing amount of people in light of, um, of COVID and, and also the racism that we're seeing in, in the U.S. And, and around the world is the lie that um, I make myself completely who I am. And so um, if I'm successful, it's because I've worked hard. Um, and if people have problems, it's because uh, they've made bad choices or the people around them have made bad choices. And, um, and so they're the, lazy. The, you yes. know, they use yeah. all lazy all the time. If they just got off their butt, then everything would be okay. What's the problem? So yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and so then the way the way to get out of the, the problems that they're facing is like stop complaining and um, get to work and uh, you know make just make more money. And uh, so this is one I, I think it, it's it's so toxic and it's it's a complete lie. The notion that um, any of us have been successful just purely through meritocracy and and not through any kind of privilege that has been handed down. And um, it's one that that I've. I've, I've seen re-emerging in the current context that we're in, in a really destructive way. I'd simply add and say, you know, there's great synergy here. So uh, I'm gonna just continue the conversation say, I, I think one of the big lies that we live by, whether it comes to gender justice, racism, economic justice, or any number of these structural wrongs is the lie of ameliorism, which is this belief that things change for the better over time, right? So for instance, when, but, but by default, by default, as if time, with the passage of time, things just get better, right? So when we talk about gender justice, racial justice, for instance, people would say, people are willing to acknowledge, right? That there, that there was racism, there was gender justice, right? <laughs> which, which, which is another way of implying, yeah, I see what you're saying, maybe in 1945, but not in 2020, right? Yeah. So, this, so well, after Obama got elected, there's no more racism. Right, no? right, right. Oh. Post, 
Postly, postly, postly. Or Hillary ran, so why is there sexism? You know, all these excuses around. So, that, yeah. I, I, I am completely, uh, I think this is one of the biggest lies of the 21st century. That's this belief in meliorism, that somehow things get better with the passage of time. And uh, therefore, therefore, and this is actually the real danger of that belief, right? That therefore, if we talk about racism or gender justice or a host, uh, any number of things, then we all, o- almost always have to talk about how much we progressed, right? So yeah, you know, some things are bad, but you know, you should also think about some of these positive things. So I think this belief in meliorism, which forces, coerces people to then lift up positive examples and then move forward and not complain, stop complaining, I think is one of the biggest uh, lies that actually have political consequences that have lethal political consequences. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Uh, I have to say, one of my, uh, this is this is probably, the energy in this conversation is so much fun, and I really wish that we were doing this in person and we could go out for a drink afterwards. This is I really know, good. Yeah. This is, this I don't is know really what good was drinking, but it was pretty dark, whatever the trip is drinking, but I mean, we all, we all need something to <laughs> it's, drink. Uh, it's later in Edinburgh, so. Yeah, it's like nine something here. We're good. We're good. And we haven't opened up at all because we trust socialist scientists that uh, base things on health outcomes. So, I, I I've been in the house 128 days and seen three people that weren't in my family. So, I yeah. might be crazy. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, but thank you, thank you all for just like the energy and the enthusiasm you're bringing into this. It's great fun. Um, so. One of the interesting kind of through lines of this conversation thus far has been about this tension between uh, the abstract and the specific, right? Specificity uh, in a variety of areas versus this uh, lie that there is a view from nowhere, right? There's a, there's a sort of uh, um, general abstract kind of basic generic truth and anything that is specific is deviating from that universal truth. And, and, and you can see this in a variety of ways and it's interesting to sort of note how it keeps popping up over and over again. So like John, um, uh, or who was it? Uh, so somebody, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting who was saying this, but we were talking about the binaries between the oppressor and the oppressed, right? So there's, you know, there's a sort of like a generic concept of being oppressed or oppressor. But then when you start getting specific, we start seeing that there are uh, specific ways in which one might be oppressed in one area and not in another, or oppressing somebody in one area, but not in another. And it's interesting kind of ladders and tangential relationships where these sort of specific avenues of oppression can pop up in, in, uh, in a variety of ways. And then there's, of course, there's also this, um, this, this issue of, uh, the fatigue, right? So, so sort of like justice fatigue and active action and activist fatigue. Um, and I like, I like the, uh, the, um, I, I like the idea that we need to be specific and targeted in the ways that we are approaching those co- or those causes or those um, those issues that we allow ourselves to become like passionately invested in, right? Um, there's a sort of a, an organic nature to sort of the evolution of, of, of what we end up caring about and, and choosing to invest in. Um, and, 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 and I think it's very wise actually. Um, and I wanna tie this into a question that's come in about um, the specificity of our language for God. And this is directly, um, this is stemming directly from, from Grace's talk, but I think it's, a, it, it, it's something that uh, all three of you uh, should jump in on. Uh, and this is the question of, um, how do we think about how do we think about the positive and negative effects of specific language for God? Um, we've been talking about a privileging of the Holy Spirit, right? A priv- privileging of the Spirit, and 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 um, I think it's it was, was you see this a lot in, in especially in Christianity in America, where we think of the Spirit as being sort of a generic thing, and we. Um, because of the way our tradition has developed, we think of the Hebrew and the Greek words for spirit as being sort of general and universal, but of course they're not. They're socially uh, contextualized words that arose in a very particular like linguistic manner and very particular sociocultural context. And so they're no more, or they're, sorry, they're no less specific than any other language that we might use for God. Yet there is such an instinctual kind of resistance to language for the spirit, language for God, when it draws on others, right? Uh, like, so non-Western languages or cultures. And so I really appreciated the ling- or the, the way that we discussed, um, uh, or that Grace was discussing the concept of chi in, 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 in her talk. And so, um, so, but I'm wondering if the three of you could perhaps address the, uh, the complexities of um, using 
perhaps surprising language for God that people are not going to be familiar with or accustomed to, um, and the, the sort of the, the potential and the challenges for specificity in our language for God, um, and probably I think particularly focus on the spirit, but I'll let you take it where you want. Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting question. And, you know, earlier when, when Tripp was talking about context, you know, context is everything. I think, um, you know, language also, as a theologian, at the end of the day, people sometimes argue with me. I think at the end of the day, the only thing we have is language or words. You know, you know, my husband's a math professor. He's got numbers. He's got all these other things. <laughs> Scientists have all these other tools. But as as theologians, at the end of the day, it's just language and words. So they are so powerful. They formulate our thoughts and ideas and how we perceive God. And so, you know, with the Israelites, Yahweh, it was a, they weren't supposed to pronounce Yahweh. It was one of those kind of, you know, it, it's Yahweh. You're not supposed to talk about. And I think there's a reverence to that. And sometimes I think we've uh, given too many names for God. I don't know. But I think somehow we got to break away from the white male European heterosexual understanding of God. And if that means we need feminine languages, if that means we need other languages from other cultures, we have to do it to understand the enormity of God, the spirit of God that hovers around the earth, over the earth that is in all of this universe. When I think about, um, the reimagining spirit that I wrote, I, I have a chapter on vibration and I think trip in my home brood, I started about vibration and I think I blew it up more about vibration. You know, um, this whole world is just full of vibration. You know, when we hear it, just vibration sounds and lights are vibrating, little atoms are vibrating, you know, God, Somehow, you know, God is in this vibration or this sound, this, this wind, because the Old Testament talks about wind. So I, I don't know where I'm going right now, because I can go into a whole talk of spirit. But I think we have to reimagine different languages of God to make our God big, because God is big and not the small, tiny little God that some Americans want to share every Sunday morning that is so constrictive, that is so restricting, that doesn't, that loves only those certain people that are good and not the bad people like us feminist theologians or us Asian American people, you know, it's just this so small God that we kind of keep perpetuating and, and, and writing about as theologians over and over again, we have to expand our notion of God. And so whatever language from Dalit theologians, from feminist theologians, from black theologians, South American, we need all the language just there is to help us understand. That's why I keep using Asian American. Growing up, I was so embarrassed about everything Asian so embarrassed everything Asian was horrible because that was the racism I was taught that I was bad that everything I embodied was negative it's only recently with BTS and Parasite that you know it's so great to be an Asian once in a while and, but you know everything so but when you think globally Asians are half the world's population you know and majority of them are from China and India right but you know that's the global population. There's so much richness. So we got to sit back and listen and use the languages of different languages. And that's why I keep going to Chi. Hmm. I wanted to raise a point um, really related to this idea that Grace is talking about of um, having this more expansive view of God. And, um, and, and this, is, this point is from, I think, um, if I remember correctly, from Elizabeth Johnson's book, uh, She Who Is, where she makes the point that um, the, the benefit of using a variety of different terms and symbols for God is actually that it surprises us and it shocks us a little bit. Um, and, and the benefit of that experience is that it breaks us out of potentially idolatrous patterns where yeah. we've become... How um, can you say we know everything about God? 
Yes. Yeah. Right. And so, because yeah, the, the the danger is that we become um, inordinately attached to certain images of God, um, which then reduces God and becomes an idol. And so, this is actually one of the benefits: is that we should feel a little disturbed when we hear a new term for God, and that's a great experience to go through because it reminds us that we don't actually know what the essence of God is, and that every every symbol and every metaphor is limited. And so, um, yeah, I thought, I thought that Daly, point real. Yeah, when you were talking, Mary Daly said, "If God is male." then the male is God. Yeah. We, we create God in our own image. And that was, you know, one of the Ten Commandments not to do that, but we continue to do it. So I think we have to have this open mind. You know, the spirit moves at where it will, you know, Yahweh, I am who I am. I will be who I will be. We have to allow God to be, but we kind of constrict God with their own limited language and so forth. So yeah, thanks for raising Elizabeth Johnson, who mm -hmm. I love. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, since we are me mentioning some of the people who have gone before us, you know, we also have to mention uh, Rosemary Radford Ruther, who said, well, if God is male, then that God, God has to be castrated, right? I mean, as much as people got angry with her for saying that during her own time, it's just simply true, right? If God is who God is, and if God will be who God will be, and if we in fact privilege the doctrine of the Holy Spirit that necessarily bra breaks boundaries, then there, there are... So there, there, there are things that need to be broken. <laughs> there are things I think there's nothing bigger than God. Right? And so our tiny little brains, you know, my brain is so tiny. And as I get older and older, I can't even remember what I talked about yesterday. It's so tiny. And to say that we have everything about God is just being. And the thing is also, I think when we, when we come to that realization, it's a very difficult one, right? I mean, just imagine the number of specificities and complexities in life. It's, it's mind boggling, right? Every day we learn something new and this comes back to the question of fatigue, right? Oh, how many complexities and uh, specificities should I learn about? But each complexity and specificity, I think, I think the important thing to realize is that each of these complexities, each of these specificities have integrity, right? They don't have simply this kind of intellectual integrity. They actually have a sacred integrity. They have dignity, right? Specificity and complexity. These categories have dignity. Human persons who are different have dignity. They're not simply, uh, they're not simply, uh, how do we put it? It's not, <laughs> in, in Boston, there's the Franklin Zoo Park, right? When you go into the Aussie aviary, there are all these brightly colored birds, right? So sometimes we, we pay $2, get a bird stick and go into the Aussie Avery and hold out this bird stick and all these different, different specific birds come onto our hands and we're so enamored with it. But the point of the, the, point of the matter is that, such, that that kind of complexity and specificity can be encountered not simply by going to the aviary, but even in our encounter with other human persons, right? Uh, and, uh, and I think... When, when you talk of the Holy Spirit, I can't help but mention Lisa Dellinger's name. Lisa Dellinger is a, nat a Native American theologian from the Chicksaw Nation. And, and, and she actually draws from your work too, Grace. Uh, and she points out how the Holy Spirit necessarily has iconoclastic properties, right? It has iconoclastic properties. Anything we think is the one view, the Holy Spirit helps us to break through that. And that happens only by paying attention to specificities and complexities, right? There's so much more to be said, but I, 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 want, I want the conversation to keep going. So let me stop there. So, um, and, and I think this is a, a, a good last question. Um, this one, I got DM'd on Twitter. Um, this is from Andrew. I assume, well, I won't give his last name. It sounds like he's in a tenuous, employable situation as a Southern Baptist minister. All right. But he said, uh, so my son came back from college uh, because of the quarantine and then started asking me all sorts of questions that he learned in his first philosophy and religion classes as a freshman. It freaked me out. I got upset. I started Googling. The next thing you know, I listen to your podcast, listen to a couple of people's podcasts. I find out about Theocon and I tell him, you will watch all these videos with me <laughs> of the best theologians from different schools. And we're going to talk about it because honestly, I just assumed everyone's read the same Bible I did and they would all know. <laughs> Wow. Okay. That's powerful and, because you know what? That happens all the time, Trip. It's not I, just one yeah, pastor. It happens all around. It does. Yeah. It does. So anyway, it's, there's quite a bit of story here. 
Um, I'll respond to that part later. But the question was, I've said seriously listening to my own white Southern Baptist son and his experience and testimony of his friend's experience and listening to these and realize that what keeps us hung up is the power locked into the unacknowledged interpretive moment where my Southern Baptist identity filters all my experiences and everyone else's voices and experiences they hear. I have no idea how to assign my congregation listening to all of these talks while listening to their son, but are, is there any advice on helping people who you think intend the best to just unlock that hermeneutical space, which is a power maneuver, to give space for the multiplicity of testimonies I've heard in the last couple of weeks and that your talks made evidently clear when we talked about them. And I, I, I just feel like that's such an important question. And it gives us a chance to say, because I mean, so often in these, you're talking to people that are professionally religious and scholars, right? So like, we don't even make jokes about the Q source because everyone already knew what it was, you know, that so much of what you hear at, on the Theocon things assumes like a certain familiarity, which also means you process this sh like culture shock of going, oh, what every religion scholar knows. And I just, I don't know. I, I, I want y'all to respond, but I mostly just want to give like the slow, solid, like confidence claps to the dad that said yes and is still hanging out with us this many sessions in. Yeah, that's amazing because not many dads or moms will be do that. They get afraid because you want your child, you, you, you know, as a parent, you know, you, you raise them up and you want them to be your mini me and you don't want them to challenge you. Uh, you want them to grow, but not grow too much. There's all these boundaries that we set up as parents. And when they start challenging stuff, he's a minister, right? So mm -hmm. our, our, the parent uh, who holds a particular way of thinking about God, it can be a threat to the parent. So I'm just grateful for our parents like this minister who will be able to sit down with their child, their daughter or son to talk about it. Because as we age, you know, and as theologians who kind of think about this, you know, I sometimes dream about it, you know, I'm thinking about it because I can't stop thinking about it. But you realize the more you know about God, the less you know. So you, at the end of the day, you just say the mystery of God. And at that point, sometimes you just have to be okay with it. Because, you know, you can have the MDiv degree, MA degree, the PhD, everything else, a demon, and you think you know everything. And at the end of the day, you're just sitting there and you go, I don't know anything. But yeah, at least you still open up your heart and your mind. And this is a journey of life and faith and be challenged by it, be pulled by it, read books by theologians that you would not normally not be reading like I'm always trying to say we should read the silence voices so those you know and publishers need to do a better job they keep um not accepting books from you know someone that no you know they always think no one's gonna read this you know no one's gonna buy it no one's gonna use it in class because it's all about you know you gotta sell the books but it starts with the publishers to challenge them and the classroom and even in the churches, all churches have some Bible study or some group book group thing going to read and listen to those voices that aren't the prevalent voices. So I'm just excited when parents are able to engage in dialogue with their sons and daughters. That's amazing. I, I simply add, I mean, whoever this dad is, I mean, I, I join you, Trip, in offering a slow clap here. <laughs> yeah, big clap. <laughs> I, I really think, right, the, 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 the slow clap is merited because the, here is a dad actually treating a question that the dad received as a question that has integrity rather than kind of subsuming the question into an already existing worldview, right? And I think this is actually the opportunity and the challenge that we have every day, right? Every day we meet somebody who challenges our worldview. 
something happens that challenges our worldview, our deeply held beliefs, right? And so to go back to the kind of Elsa Tamez quote that I used before, how do we then hold the interpretation of scripture and the interpretation of our deeply held beliefs in creative tension with the interpretation of life in all its complexity in one single movement? How do we do that? How do we not simply subsume everything into an already existing worldview? I think it's just such, such, such an interesting opportunity that we have in front of us to teach, to, to treat each thing as a thing that has integrity, right? And so that's simply what I would say. Mm. I love that phrase that he, he used, or I don't know if this is from him or from you, Trip, but um, the unacknowledged hermeneutical moment. Um, and uh, I think that's so important. And, um, and I would just share from my own experience that um, coming from an evangelical background, which really emphasized um, literal interpretation of scripture as kind of the only way to interpret scripture. And it, it's, it, it's so easy to speak about our own worldview as if it's just common sense. And this is just obvious. Um, and so what, what was sort of the breaking point for me that um, enabled me to see the unacknowledged hermeneutical moments that were happening was uh, reading some of the historical theologians that, that shaped the early church. And then you realize that in the early church, they had all these different ways of interpreting scripture and the literal was kind of the lowest one. Like they thought if you're a really baby Christian, then you, you interpret the Bible in a literal way. But if you're kind of ascending to the higher levels and you have the spiritual reading and the anagogical reading and, and these types of things. And that completely blew my mind um, because I, I had been so trained and it seemed obvious to me that this is just common sense that you read the Bible literally. And so, yeah, I think to, to echo what John and Grace have been saying is it's yeah, it getting exposed to different points of view where you realize that what seems like common sense um, to you is actually part of a whole, a whole intellectual tradition that you've inherited. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, a, amazing conversation happening between this, this father and son. And Trip, just to go back to that parent, you know, my child came home from college this spring too and asked those very questions. But, you know, I, because I wasn't threatened, it was a very good thing. And I just think, you know, I wish more and more people in the church would do that instead of, you know, what Megan was talking about, this baby kind of literal way of approaching Christianity and, and the hermeneutics of scripture, that people will grow, you know, in one way life is short in other ways life is long and and so when life is long it gives this opportunity to grow in our faith and understand and be challenged and that you know we won't have this baby literal <laughs> sense of you know how we were created etc so thankful for that yeah, and, and, and what I love about these points that you guys are making is how it applies not only to the way we think about God and, uh, and, and, and like the interpretation of scripture and the hermeneutics when it, when it comes to theological doctrinal issues, but also, of course, how it, how, how it affects the way that we understand the crises in which we're in, right? This is exactly the same, the same kind of psychological and emotional hurdles that we're, that we're running up against when we're trying to convince people, convince ourselves of systemic racism, of the various forms of injustice in which we're all complicit, because it yeah, doesn't we'll, feel that yeah. we're complicit. And when we think about theology, you know, we put doctrine of God, doctrine of Christ, doctrine of the church, we separate it, but we realize it's all intersecting. And that's why I think all roads lead to scripture and all, lead, all roads lead to intersectionality. That to understand God is to understand ourselves. Yep. How, we, how we worship God is how we treat one another. Mm -hmm. And how not just human beings I'm talking about, but all of creation, all of creation care and sustainability. So mm -hmm. these are all intersecting. So people have to realize this sooner than later so mm -hmm. that we don't actually destroy one another through this COVID and destroy the earth too, because this climate justice is a huge thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's what it's really, I mean, it's really as much about posture and orientation to the experiences that we are having and living in as anything else. Right. Yeah. So it's not like, it's not like we need, need to be convinced of like a certain set of facts. It's a, it's an orientation to the way uh, an orientation towards reality yeah. that is, um, that requires like a deep fundamental openness, um, and, and, and a sort of a curiosity, um, yeah. And, and, a, and a willingness to be challenged, right? And as, if we can get into that posture, yeah. then there are so many opportunities. Um, and, and yeah, and earlier when Tripp was talking about the biggest lie, if we keep perpetuating this white male God, it's gonna affect how we relate to everybody and how 
the church is structured, etc. So all these things intersect. These are all related. Everything is like all, it's not so clean cut. It's all messy. So understanding that will just help us get through this crisis and any other crisis, because this won't be the last one. There'll be many more crises that we'll be facing. So uh, I think these are very important conversations. Grace. I mean, like you're saying, it's definitely hard. I mean, undermining this white male God idea that is so like omnipresent. <laughs> oh yeah. You know what? This white right. male God has gotten into uh, so much trouble. Because, yeah, so, so you know, we we really have to dismantle that big lie, so that we can get rid of the fear and talk about belonging and and get rid of racism and the sexism and the climate injustice that's happening. Everything else, so it's all intertwined. It's hard. I mean, just think about white male God and think about intersections with patriarchy. How difficult is it to? How difficult it is, for instance, in church context, to simply use the word she. Oh, mm -hmm. people will stop coming to church. That's the thing. And we get so Let's just replace all the he's with she for just one worship service, right? Just yeah. one, not the whole yeah. So John, one. the non-threatening way is then just use spirit, God, because, you know, it's gone through different genders, but still now people think it's a neuter kind of way of understanding. So anyway, this, yeah. So that was my answer to getting away because I know when you start using mother and she and whatever else, feminine images, people get so afraid that this is not Christianity. You know, they think it's something else. And then, they, you know, they think you're a heretic and all the labels that come along. So spirit well, somehow, because it's part of the Trinitarian language <laughs> from the early church, people feel not less threatened. But then when you have this global understanding of the spirit, then people get a little all up tight again. <laughs> so. Yeah, I, I, I would just say that one option for if you're a parent is if you do prayers with your children every night, um, you, it's always our mother who art in heaven. And that way it averages out and skews female because they only go to worship service once or twice a week. <laughs> And the rest of the week at home, it's our mother. And you figure like the, the frequency of the family uh -huh. Uh -huh. equals the <laughs> ubiquitousy of the masculine in the worship service. Yeah. Um, and actually, Tripp, this is off the point, but it's, to me, I find it very interesting, the biblical language that it uses our instead of my, because in Western Christianity, oh, that's, the dualism that's really is good. embedded, everything is my, 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 my God, everything. It's only in the Eastern ways of thinking that we always think plural, like our God and our church, etc. I just find that very intriguing, but that's, that's besides the point. That is like literally the best beginning of a chapter in some book I hope you're writing, because... <laughs> Like, like <laughs> you said that, and then I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I'm supposed to wrap this up right now. But <laughs> I also would like to have a sermon, sermonic excursus. So um, well, I'm going to probably put it in one of the books I'm writing right now about the hour, because I'm talking about community and the belongingness, et cetera. But I just find it very interesting that mm -hmm. white Euro people have been using our for two centuries and nobody ever thought of saying, oh, you know what? It should have been my, <laughs> but anyway, I'm just happy that it's our, <laughs> because yes. Western people all love my so much. Well, the, but, uh, uh, the, the session tomorrow night at 10 on the UK, 5 PM on Eastern standard time is with uh brian mclaren who if you should go check out his keynote talk which is talking about uh, theology in a time of crisis set off by authoritarian regimes um he's not just talking about whatever video game he's been playing recently uh there are apparently historical uh moments that lead to thinking about theology in time of authoritarian crisis and uh daniel white hodge um is did a a uh I talk about a theology of hopelessness and what is it like at, in the black church in America to recognize the way in which a, uh, a, a white notion of hope and Christian mission is so internalized that you have to detox from, um, or what did, what did uh, Grace call it? American-anity, 
Christian or American Christianity hybrid. Yeah. yeah Trip, American thank you for using I've been using it forever by myself. I'm so glad to hear that you, you can use it too just, with me. It's, it's, so it's, it's a not complicated word. It's Americanity. Americanity. <laughs> yes, there you Americanity. Go. White Christians here have never had Christianity. It's Americanity. And Trump is like the king of Americanity. I'm so glad. We Trump. don't want to call him king. He's a. Okay. He, you know, because but, yeah. that, he might but take you know that as mean. an affirmation. He thinks he's, he's, he thinks he's king. That's what he I'm He thinks saying. he's king. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the, the tan one uh, and Americanity. <laughs> but uh, Daniel's papers, great on that. And then uh, um, uh, Ryan Newsom, who's responding, just had a brand new book published on Confederate monuments, which uh, I'm sure when he wrote it, didn't realize it would be uh, that his book set in stone was going to be um, that timely, but nonetheless, uh, tomorrow night, I'm sure we'll pick up a lot of these themes. And so we're looking forward to it and can't believe we had such a great time with our three friends who joined tonight. Um, keep it zesty. And, uh, if you're a whitehead and you know, that's an affirmation that you too internalize the eternal virtue of adventure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It was so great. Thanks so Thank much for you. being here. Great to talk to you guys. You guys are great. Thank you so